Now I know what you're thinking. You're looking at it and you're saying, oh my God, it's absolutely massive. It's big, it's black, it scares little children. People go running in terror. Yes, it is the wing on my 2020 Supra. I've had this car for six months now, and this is easily the most controversial car of 2019, 2020. So let's talk about my six month ownership experience. We're gonna go through it in detail, get to the nitty gritty, and we're gonna find out if this car is really worth owning. All right, the cabin, it's pretty small. So this architecture is quite stiff. It's called the Klar architecture and it's shared with BMW. In fact, this is shared with the Z4. It is always a challenge getting into this cabin. It is a pretty small cabin and it has a pretty low roof line. As you can see, I've got the camera way down and it has a very wide sill. So getting into this vehicle and getting out is a little bit difficult. Once you're in here, there's plenty of headroom. There's no problem, I can even wear a helmet. But getting in and out is a bit of a contortionist act. This is the premium edition. It has upgraded JBL audio, navigation, heated seats, a heads-up display, wireless charging, and USB. I'm not a huge guy. I'm only five foot nine, so this cabin fits me really, really well. But if you're a really big guy, you might want to check it out first. Perhaps something like the C8 Corvette might be a little bit of a better choice for you. But that said, uh, there's people that are over six foot tall that have fit in here without any real issues. The steering wheel, this is right out of a BMW. There's no getting around it. One thing that I do not like about the steering wheel is the really prominent Toyota logo. It is oval and the steering wheel is round and there's something aesthetically about it being so big and so prominent that this oval thing in the middle of a round wheel, call me crazy, but it kind of bugs me. And I think the steering wheel is the least attractive part of the interior. Now these paddles are pretty good too. I'm not sure if they're metal or plastic, but they have a really solid kind of feel to them, a nice click that makes it very obvious when you're changing gears. The dash is quite good. It's dominated by a really big tachometer. Everything is digital, of course, and it's quite easy to read under all conditions. It's got a heads up display, which shows your speed and your navigation and your music selection. Not a whole lot else. It's not too distracting. You can adjust the heads up for the height and also the rotation. On the right side of the tack is a little display for navigation. So that's kind of nice when you're coming up to a turn, it pops up the instructions, the directions, so you can see if you're turning left or right. But when uh, the navigation isn't near a turn, it's basically just blank. The materials in here are really nice for the price point. Everything is pretty much soft touch. The fit and finish is very good. It's very Toyota, even though obviously they're taking a lot of BMW components uh, to make the interior. It's got real carbon fiber in the center console, which is a really nice touch. And these vents, these are the one thing that really doesn't look to BMW. They're brushed aluminum. They've got a really nice weight to them. And everything in the cabin is just really intuitive, really easy to use. I actually quite like it. There's really not a lot of distractions in here. Now at this price point, you've definitely got some competition from Porsche. At the entry level price, their cabins are pretty basic. And then of course you've got the C8 and you've probably seen this already, but there are stitching issues with the material in the C8 Corvette. I know some people have been complaining about the drink holders for some reason, but I think they're very good. They're actually very deep and they can hold cups of different sizes, which is kind of nice. So you can put your big gulp in here or you can put a little Starbucks cappuccino in too. And they're both gonna stick at 1G of lateral load while you're ripping through the canyons. The infotainment system is iDrive. It's out of the last generation of BMW. I think that's actually an advantage. I think it is easier to use. If you're familiar with the new Toyota infotainment system, this is miles and miles ahead of any Toyota, any Lexus. It is much more fully featured. It's a lot easier to use. It's a lot more intuitive. If you don't like iDrive, you're probably not gonna like it. But again, I don't think Toyota is offering anything that is comparable to this right now. And the voice recognition actually works surprisingly well when you give it an address. Navigate to the nearest gas station.
768525 South Sepulveda Boulevard, Los Angeles, say yes or select another entry from the list. Now that said, there are some downsides to the infotainment system. The display is 8.8 .8 inches, which is pretty good, but it is kind of on the dim side. I was able to adjust that with a software hack, but it's a little bit slow also. It is touch display, it's touch sensitive, so that's kind of nice. You can also use the iDrive controller as well. I know I keep calling it iDrive. I can't remember what Toyota actually calls it, but essentially it is an iDrive. It does have wireless Apple CarPlay, and for the most part, it works pretty well for me. It does have some issues in that about 20% of the time, it just refuses to connect. If your phone doesn't have Bluetooth and wireless turned on when you get in the car, it's gonna be a little bit of a problem. Let's talk about a couple of the downsides. One of them is this JBL audio system. This is part of the premium package, which is a $4,000 option. And it is really, really disappointing. It has 10 speakers, and part of the problem is the placement of the speakers. It's a pretty small cabin, and that does make it very difficult to get really good audio, especially with imaging. The, the imaging in here is, is terrible, in my opinion. The tweeters are placed too low in the doors. And the real problem with the system is these horrible subwoofers. They rattle. And I'm not saying that they just have a little bit of distortion. They actually rattle quite loudly. It is terrible. And I just kind of find it quite disappointing that this is the upgraded audio system and this car costs $54,000. I really wish it was better. There's another downside that everybody that owns a Super is complaining about, and that is wind buffeting. When you're going at anything more than about 25, 30 miles an hour, you get this buffeting effect and there's a lot of air that kind of gets trapped inside the cabin. There are some aftermarket fixes, they're quite inexpensive, and you can go to Home Depot and for about $3, you can put some little foam strips on there and that actually reduces the wind buffeting quite a bit up until about 100 miles an hour, which I've never been on a public road. But if you're going to the track and you're frequently over 100 miles an hour, it's a bit of an issue. But overall, the build quality is really, really high. I would say in terms of fit and finish, it is absolutely at the top of its game in this price class. It's definitely better than any American car. And I think overall it gets the job done and I'm quite, I'm quite happy with it. And if you're wondering, this wing is quite heavy and it makes the hatch a little bit of a chore to put up, but the sacrifices we make for beauty and performance. The styling is something that can be quite polarizing. At the beginning, before this car came out, and when people had only really seen it on the internet, there was a lot of negativity about the styling, but it is quite unique in the segment. There's nothing that really looks anything like a Supra. The nose of the car is something that is probably the most controversial because it doesn't really look like the FT1 concept where the center of the grille was filled in, where here it's open. I think personally that the rear of the car is one of my favorite angles. Some people think it's busy, but to each its own. I've tried to show you a lot of the lines of the vehicle. I'm sure you know that the internet trolls have had a field day with this car. This is easily one of the most talked about cars on social media in the last couple of years. And for good reason, this car has been out of production since about 1997. So we're talking about 17 years that there has been no Toyota Supra, at least a new one. So let's sort of jump to the chase. How good is this car and how well does it drive? I'm here in the canyons and I can tell you it is excellent. It is so much fun to drive in the canyons, and here's why. First, let's talk about let's talk about the suspension. Let's talk about the handling. So this has adaptive dampers, and they are actually Monroe active dampers. I pulled them out of the car. So Monroe is part of a group that also owns Olens, and if you know Olens, they are famous for racing suspension. So these dampers are able to adjust uh, about a hundred times a second and that really gives them the ability to do micro adjustments for imperfections on the road, little bits of weight transfer and so forth, adjust for your speed and basically what you're doing with the car. So the ride is very, very good in fact. The ride is got a little bit of suppleness and it handles the imperfections on the road really well. But when you go around a corner, these dampers are able to stiffen up and really 
handle the corner pretty well, so it doesn't beat you up in the city. And I'm going around a corner here, you know, at about the speed limit, and it handles really well. It sticks really, really well. It gives you a lot of confidence driving this car because it is very easy to drive, and that's one of the fun things that I like about the Supra. It is very easy to drive. There's no real surprises here in this car, even though it has a short wheelbase. Now, there's a lot of electrical magic going on. There's a lot of suspension trickery going on with these adaptive dampers and the vehicle dynamic system, traction control, and so forth, because this car has got quite a short wheelbase. The car naturally will want to rotate with a, a wheelbase this short, so Toyota has done a really good job with the adaptive suspension and with the electronics in this car too. So you can push it and it doesn't really feel like it's intervening very aggressively, unlike a lot of BMW setups when you go to M or M dynamic mode, whatever it's called nowadays, you can really feel the intervention kicking in. You can feel the, the power cut. You can feel the brake starting to drag on one of the four corners, whatever you're doing. And it basically tucks you back into line and kind of kills your fun. So this will allow you to slide a little bit when you're in sport mode. The steering is quite good. It's very communicative. Obviously, we've gone away from the days of lovely hydraulic racks, which I do miss them. I do miss those days a whole lot because we just had so much more feel. But this is quite good for an electrical rack. It gives pretty good feedback. In fact, I compared this car back to back with my friend's M2 not the competition, which would have been a, a better comparison. And we both felt that this car was, it gave you higher confidence driving it around in the canyons because it does have a little bit more compliance. The BMW M2 and the M2 competition, they are more sort of hardcore cars in terms of the suspension and the tuning. And they just feel a lot firmer and a little bit more, uh, you know, jiggly on a road like this. There's less softness, there's less uh, give, there's less, uh, absorption of the bumps. Now, I will say that I have some aftermarket springs on this car. I have the HKS adjustable spring kit, and that has done a good job of controlling some of the ride motions because the way this car comes from the factory, the springs are on the soft side. There's no question when you're talking about biasing a car towards uh, being able to commute and comfort and go across the country versus going on track. Every sports car is a compromise to some degree and Toyota has really spent a lot of time making a nice balanced compromise where this is a little bit more balanced towards the street. This will understeer on track, it will it will understeer a little bit and you, you, the thing is you can also do power oversteer to kind of correct that and it's pretty fun to drive from that perspective but you know that is one of the things that Toyota, I think, has done a very good job at is this sort of compromise. So that's one of the things that'll happen if you have it in manual and you forget to upshift. I actually thought I had it in sport mode, in automatic mode, but I didn't. So it's able to hold a gear which is kind of a nice thing because a lot of transmissions now will automatically upshift for you when you hit the rev limiter, but this doesn't. So there's a lot of control. The paddles are very, very responsive in this car. You can shift up and down quite quickly just by tapping the paddle, and it's, it's pretty much instantaneous. It's very good. I love those crackles and pops too. Those sound really nice. So yes, it's an automatic transmission, but it is a pretty engaging automatic, I have to say. It's the ZF8HP. This is one of the most popular transmissions sold today. I don't know how many millions of these they've sold, but they are featured in all kinds of different products from the, uh, the Jeep Grand Cherokee to the Dodge Hellcat to Alfa Romeo to all kinds of BMWs to, I don't even know, it's a very popular transmission is very, very well sorted out. And this is probably the best tuned version of that transmission that I've actually driven. And I think I'm a, I'm a big say the manuals guy, there's no question. And I think this car definitely would be better with a manual, especially at, at this price point. I, I think it sort of demands a manual. 
but it's a low volume car. But anyways, I really like the automatic transmission of this car. It makes it very livable on a day-to-day -day basis. This is my daily driver and I do drive it in the city. And for an automatic, it's pretty good. It doesn't have the crispness of a DCT. It doesn't sort of bang off the shifts uh, with that sort of precision or at least the feeling of precision, but it is very quick. It shifts in about 200 milliseconds which is about twice as slow as the Corvette, the new C8 Corvette, which is about 100 milliseconds, but it's still very, very quick. All right, so let's do a little launch control at the tunnel here. Let's see how it sounds. Sounds pretty good. So this is the B58-8 engine. This is not a 2JZ, it's not a 3JZ, it's not a 5JZ, it's not whatever the internet trolls wanted it to be for the heritage and the legacy because as I was saying before, this car has not been around for quite a while, but the Mark IV is the Supra that everyone kind of idolizes and looks up to in large part because there was a big tuning community which formed partially around that car, the Japanese tuning community, in the late 90s. But then, of course, there was a particular movie which garnered a lot of interest in this car. And, you know, what the internet trolls don't want to admit is that the Supra, the Mark IV Supra, was canceled due to lack of sales, lack of interest. The car was too expensive at the time. It was it was, you know, really priced well above the market for for what it was. And the performance was wasn't that great out of the box with the Mark IV at the time. It was, you know, relatively quick, but it was no it was no rocket. You really had to tune it to uh, get the full potential out of it. And that's kind of what everybody thinks about a Supra being is the tunability of the vehicle. So this engine is so good. It has so much torque that is available all across the rev band. You've got maximum torque from about 1600 RPM and we are talking about a lot of torque. It is just a wall of torque and that makes it really easy to drive, especially in the city. It's very, very responsive. There's really no turbo lag in this car at all. The only way you can feel it is if you're in manual and you're holding a gear and it doesn't kick down and you nail it, you get just the slightest hint of lag. But it's really just about imperceptible. They've really done a great job of tuning out the lag in this car. So this engine, let's just put it in, uh, let's just put it in sport mode here. Let it do its thing. All right, so right now it's in sixth gear. I'm going pretty slow, coming up to a corner. So let me just, I just wanna let you hear what this engine sounds like. If you're in the market for a car at the fifty to sixty thousand dollar level, you've actually got a lot of competition. You've got a lot of choices. You've got the BMW M2 competition. You've got the Camaro, the ZL1 1LE. It's about sixty thousand dollars. Has six hundred and fifty horsepower. You've got the C7 Corvette. I don't think the C8 really competes with this. It's kind of in a different price class. It starts at sixty, and you all know when you get the options and you get the adaptive suspension, you kind of match the configuration that this has, you're looking at mid 70s. And then of course you've got the Cayman. I don't get an opportunity to buy a car all that often. And when this car was announced and it hadn't been around for 17 years, I thought that was really interesting. It was an opportunity to get into a car with a brand new chassis, a brand new platform. And right now in the sports car market, which we know is shrinking, there's less and less competition. There's less and less choices available and this is something that still represents a bit of a throwback to the, I think it's sort of the end of an era really because you've got a front engine rear wheel drive car. It's not electrified yet and we know that's going to happen. This is probably the last gas powered Supra gas only. I think everything's moving over to hybridization right now. So our choices are fairly limited. So six months later as an owner, I'm really happy. The, the most important thing about a car for me is that it's emotional and I feel 
a real connection to this car. It's a real driver's car. I'm very happy with my purchase. If you're interested, hit me up. I'll be happy to talk about the Supra with you. I've got a part store. It's going to be linked down below. I've got t-shirts available. I've got some parts for the Supra. If you like this channel, please go ahead and subscribe. And there's also a Discord chat down below. You can chat about the Supra all day long. My name is Eric, and I will see you in the next video.